Next, I'd like to invite up uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Meltzer. Um, again, you know, going with the theme of the importance of multidisciplinary care, um, Dr. Meltzer is an anesthesiologist and uh, an intensivist. Uh, he's actually in charge of uh, cardiac intensive care um, at uh, UCLA, and he and his team uh, take care of our patients uh, really at multiple points. Um, during you know, the, the most critical period uh, that our patients go through, um, be that um, cardiac catheterization with intervention or EP study requiring uh, anesthesia, general or otherwise, uh, or if they go to the OR, uh, requiring cardiac anesthesia. If some of our congenital patients require uh, non-cardiac surgery, um, you know, we, we generally will ask their team to also be involved. And then really, most importantly, uh, the peri- and post-operative care in the, uh, in the ICU, uh, post-transplant, post-Fontan conversion, et cetera. So without further ado, Dr. Meltzer. <clears throat> thanks, Jamil. Um, thanks a lot for having me. It's really an honor to be here. It's been great talks this morning. Um, I usually like to have this talk be only five minutes, but I have 15 minutes today. Um, so it's going to be some broad strokes, how we sort of think about things in the OR for anesthesia, and also how we sort of think about issues with single ventricle patients, usually the Fontan, um, in the ICU. Um, I have no disclosures to discuss, other than I really think that intensive care is a team sport. And um, a lot of times what we do in the ICU as the ICU attending or fellow or the intensivist is kind of try to communicate and coordinate care as best we can with all of these experts that you're hearing from. Um, so Fontan circulation, we tend end up managing when complications arise. And mostly that has to do with pulmonary vascular resistance and relative pulmonary hypertension ventricular morphology, systolic and diastolic dysfunction, AV valve function, and then arrhythmias, really. Um, this, this schematic kind of shows that the, the synergistic problem of increasing pulmonary vascular resistance and increasing stiffness of the ventricle. And as these things happen, you can see the cardiac output drops precipitously. Um, and really what we do mostly in the ICU is manipulate heart rate and stroke volume when we think about hemodynamics. And the problem is these people with Fontans and failing valves don't really respond to our usual interventions normally. Their heart rate response is abnormal. Um, their ventricular function is abnormal systolically and diastolically. And they're really not able to increase their stroke volume all that much. So the things that we like to use, these tools, inotropes, vasodilators, beta blockers, et cetera, um, don't have their usual impact. Um, we'll hear a lot more about arrhythmias, um, and these can be atrial um, or ventricular, and there's a lot of reasons these occur that I think Dr. Shannon's going to get into, um, but we aggressively prophylax in the post-operative period for any procedure um, for mostly atrial and ventricular dysrhythmias, and we're always prepared in the OR and the ICU for the need for uh, essentially emergent cardioversion and defibrillation. Um, shunts affect the oxygenation and blood flow in these patients, and, and the shunts may be right to left or, or left to right. A very vexing problem postoperatively is protein losing enteropathy. Um, the patients lose a lot of protein into their intestinal lumen. Um, and that may be due to very high SVC pressures or mesenteric inflammation. And they end up with edema, immunodeficiency, ascites, hypercoagulability, and electrolyte imbalance. Um, this portends a poor prognosis longitudinally and uh, portends a lot of problems in the ICU as well. Um, they're usually steroid-dependent patients. Um, what it leads to is a frail patient. 
And this is something that we're seeing a lot more in the ICU and paying a lot more attention to of late. And it essentially has to do with malnutrition, muscle loss, decreasing strength, inability to exercise, and it's sort of a, a vicious cycle. It's defined as three or more of any of these um, criteria. And pre-frail would be defined as two of, of these criteria. And when we see these patients come in that are very, very uh, trim and skinny, uh, that actually makes us concerned. A lot of times there's um, developmental delay and neurologic dysfunction. Um, it's not always due to the parents, Lee. There is actually um, a slight skewing of the, the IQ um, in these patients toward um, developmental delay. And it's unclear if it's multiple times on bypass or chronic hypoxemia or, or embolic effect. Thromboembolism is a big problem and we worry about bleeding and clotting in the ICU all the time, and that bleeding may be due to treatment or um, innate liver dysfunction, um, but we also worry quite a bit about thrombosis. Uh, here's a CT scan of someone with a pulmonary embolism. So when taking these patients into the operating room, um, I thought I'd give you kind of a 10,000-foot view of what we think about. Um, we know what is important for a successful Fontan circulation, and so we want to preoperatively, uh, you know, make a full assessment of the venous pressures, try to get any assessment of pulmonary vascular resistance we can, how's the AV valve function on recent echoes, um, rhythm, and of course, ventricular function. Um, most anesthesiologists who care for these patients are well aware that, you know, the CVP is, is very, very important in these patients, and it's essentially the driving pressure to blood to the lungs. Um, and they spend a lot of time trying to maintain a normal sinus rhythm and very, very cautiously use negative inotropes. We tend to try to avoid as best we can medications that inc increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, like alpha adrenergic agonists and nitrous oxide. We then also try to avoid patient factors that increase pulmonary vascular resistance, hypoxemia, hypercarbia, acidosis, respiratory or metabolic. We tend to try to avoid pain and light anesthesia with well aware that no pain and deep anesthesia gives us other problems like systemic hypotension. And we aggressively try to avoid hypothermia. In the ICU or OR, try to um, ventilate patients with a strategy that d will not increase pulmonary vascular resistance, trying to find this sort of Goldilocks zone between underinflation and overinflation of the lungs, probably attempting to maintain spontaneous ventilation and avoid mechanical ventilation altogether if possible is best, but that's not always possible. If we do go towards mechanical ventilation, try to avoid hyperinflation, elevated PEEP, and elevated uh, inspiratory pressures. Um, you can see that there is a significant effect of increasing pulmonary vascular resistance here and here on cardiac output. So we spend time looking to figure out where is the Fontan patient on the spectrum of well-functioning versus failing Fontan. We use our usual uh, labs and history and physical recent echo results, and a discussion with the cardiologist who hopefully is well aware of wh what the patient's um, issues are. There's issues with antibiotics and systemic emboli. This is a little bit of an algorithm that's designed to figure out, well, where is this patient on the spectrum of their functioning Fontan? And we would l certainly rather have patients on the functioning side than the non-functioning side. And we look to systemic changes, um, ascites, peripheral edema, liver dysfunction, SVC syndrome, to figure out where the patient may be. Um, we use the usual monitoring for relatively simple or short procedures, like oxygenation, gas analysis, and rhythm. But for any major surgery or critical illness, 
arterial line CVP and some form of echocardiography is, is tantamount. The induction of anesthesia, try to avoid thiopental because of its myocardial depression, but we've seen this in the cath lab um, with propofol as well, um, that the negative inotropic effects are very significant in these patients. So I can't say that I would use a one-size-fits-all approach, really tailor things. In terms of main, maintaining anesthesia or sedation, we try to balance the anesthetic to mitigate the side effects of either. So some type of balanced narcotic with uh, volatile as well. Um, trying to maintain or lower the patient's pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, we guide our fluid therapy by echo and uh, CVP measurements. When mechanically ventilating someone, as I said, got to consider spontaneous versus controlled ventilation. Spontaneous ventilation, you may end up with uh, untoward hypercarbia or hypoxemia, whereas when we put someone on a mechanical ventilation, we increase intrathoracic pressure and decrease venous return and then therefore decrease pulmonary blood flow and cardiac output um, drops with that. Regional anesthesia, well, not all procedures are really open to that, and patients coming in who are significantly anticoagulated obviously have a problem. In the ICU and the OR, we manipulate hemodynamics. That's one of the main things we spend time doing. Um, increasing systemic vascular resistance, uh, we often think about vasopressin, thinking that uh, it may not increase the pulmonary vascular resistance as significantly as some of these other medications. And in terms of lowering systemic vascular resistance, avoiding anxiety and pain, and using a combination of inodilators and just vasodilators. Uh, we're not usually in the adult population trying to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, but we do spend a lot of time trying to decrease it. And that might be using oxygen or respiratory alkalosis or things like nitric oxide or inhaled Flolan. Um, there's no mystery in how to increase someone's cardiac output. We use the same tools we would use um, in uh, the standard population as we would in the Fontan population. But we do spend time trying to keep AV synchrony and if we do need to um, mechanically ventilate some, use sedation and paralysis to help us reduce the amount of um, uh, VO2 increase. Um, Postoperatively, we spend time on some hard endpoints and some fuzzy endpoints. Um, the hard endpoints is monitoring for volume shifts postoperatively. Um, these people are very, very exquisite to sensitive, exquisitely sensitive to volume, being overloaded and dehydrated. Um, pain control, whether that be with a PCA or an epidural, kind of mitigating the, the systemic vascular tone of a regional anesthetic versus the increasing pulmonary vascular resistance of standard narcotics. Um, watching for oxygen saturations and trying to maintain them above preoperative levels. Um, and then engaging with thromboprophylaxis and often therapeutic anticoagulation. On the fuzzier side in the ICU, we tend to use a multidisciplinary team approach. We round with the congenital um, adult cardiologist once or twice a day. We employ MDR and rounding um, and that uh, patient-centered care approach. And with this population, obviously, um, the parents are greatly involved. Um, we try to mobilize and exercise our patients. And sometimes these patients are relatively younger and they engage in some gaming or rehab type approaches to rehabilitation in the ICU. And then finally, I wrote uh, PAD, which is pain, agitation, and delirium. Um, we don't often think about this population being, you know, a little bit younger as having problems with pain, agitation, delirium in the ICU, but I think it's relatively underdiagnosed. Some special considerations. Um, we see these patients in the OB suite, um, and we worry a lot about in, uh, regional anesthesia here and anticoagulation as well as significant volume shifting. Um, ECMO. Uh, is a modality we've used in this population uh, quite a bit. And so we try to engage with an ECMO consult relatively early if we think that someone might need that. Um, there is 
uh, real consideration of abdominal compartment syndrome due to ascites production, low protein, and lots of fluid shifts, especially when infection and sepsis uh, complicates the ICU stay. We try to use laparoscopic surgery um, if the surgical approach is amenable to that, um, realizing that CO2 insufflation has significant uh, impact on pulmonary vascular resistance. A lot of these patients are vac vascular access nightmares, and so we try to go back through the patient record to see where people have struggled with, whether it be central lines or peripheral lines, so we don't reinvent the wheel um, in trying to place a central line in either blind vessels or vessels that don't exist. Um, bleeding due to collateral circulation, um, particularly at chest reentry, um, is a big, big problem. So we've got to be prepared for uh, massive bleeding in the OR and the ICU. Hepatopathy, you've all heard about. Um, AKI and chronic kidney disease. Um, the creatinine often will underestimate the level of renal dysfunction in these patients, whether if they are quite, uh, have low muscle mass and sarcopenia, and it's a, a high-risk uh, problem. Um, CVVHD we use, and I talked a little about sedation and delirium. Um, in your syllabus, I have a couple references that I think are really general overviews of the topic, and um, I'll be available for questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you.